Okay, so uh, welcome again to um, our latest Travolution lockdown webcast. Um, today we're going to talk to uh, an academic expert in technology and also how that applies to the travel sector. So I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Karen Panetta, who's an IEEE Fellow and Dean of Graduate Engineering at Tufts University over in the States. He's actually in Massachusetts, if I said that correctly. Um, so welcome, Karen. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Good. So um, the reason we asked you on to do one of these is that you've contributed to a report by uh, Finn Partners over in the UK, which I had a quick look at. And it looks um, at uh, technology for the future in a, in a sort of post-COVID or post-pandemic world from a number of perspectives. Um, but particularly your section looks at the application of artificial intelligence. Um, particularly on the airport and, and the sort of transport side of things. But we can talk more broadly about where you think AI might, might change things and might be applicable to our sector. Um, let, let, let's begin as an academic with some definitions so that people know sort of broadly <laughs> where we're talking. Um, AI is, you know, it's one of those buzzwords actually and it's probably been around a long time and, and, and there are different definitions and different views of what it is and how it differs from so from your perspective, explain what, what you see as being real AI, how it differs from machine sure. learning. So, so to me, art, artificial intelligence, machine learning is like a subset of artificial intelligence. But if you want to encapsulate what artificial intelligence is, it's really using computing to either emulate or to uh, you know, assist or automate what a human expert would do. Mm -hmm. So that's why sometimes you, you either see there's the robots that are going to take over the world or, you know, there's those that are actually going to be your, um, companions, those types of robots. Those are the science fiction more ones that we see. But really, artificial intelligence is the use of technology to either enhance human performance or to capture that expertise and do much larger um, computations than, than we can do on our own to explore new spaces that we you know, would love to investigate across everything, including medicine and travel. I guess what I've heard about AI is, is, is it's certainly based around, I mean, it came out of sort of big data, doesn't it? So you've got all this masses of data. It's actually impossible for a single human being to, to, to calculate all that, all that data. Right. And go, yes. you know, so, so, so an AI machine can look at huge data and look for trends that a human simply couldn't see or couldn't so it can process it can process because of cloud computing and the, and the you know the the cost of computing today versus you know 20 years ago we can now do large scale computations on massive amounts of data that would take humans you know a, a lifetime to get through or to do that analysis so that's big data is a, is a an integral part i would say of artificial intelligence and is that why AI is coming to the fore now? It's, it's, not, it's not a new concept, you know, it's been- It is not new, it is not new at all. Written, the written by science fiction writers for many, many decades, <laughs> isn't it? So what, what, what's, what is it about now that's bringing AI to the fore? Is, is, is it cloud, is it data, is it cost of computing? Or, you know, sort of so there's a couple of things. One is, is the cloud, you know, the availability of computing, which we didn't have before. Um, when I started, I was using a single CPU doing all my simulations. Now, we, you know, you've got access to the cloud. The second one you mentioned was the data and that there's tons of it, you know, there's, you know, terabytes uploaded every minute onto the internet. And then the third thing, Lee, is sensors. The cost of sensors everywhere or uh, internet of things. So these sensors are everywhere. They're cameras, they're um, chemical sensors, they're, they're absolutely everywhere. And this, the cost has come down significantly. So now we can deploy them everywhere, which means I can capture even more data than I couldn't handle before. <laughs> And, and, and one final thing before we move on to the application in travel um, is AI, uh, computing previously was you, you, what you put in, you got out, you sort of, you asked the computer to do something, it did it, it gave you the answer. W one thing about AI is it, it, will, it will find things you didn't ask it to because it's, it's clever enough to say, I, I, I will look for trends that even you haven't thought about yet. That, that, that's kind of ex exciting, but that's maybe where the scary bit comes in because <laughs> Well, we have to be really careful because unfortunately too many people do think it's a black box that I'm going to give it data and it's going to magically, you know, tell me the secrets of the universe. Yeah. And really, that's not the way it works. The way it works is the, the biggest problems with AI right now, challenges, is that it has to learn, it has to be trained. 
And the way you train it is usually from expert data. So for instance, I do cancer diagnosis and you know, in an image, I'm not a medical doctor. So I have to have people look at the x-rays or the CAT scans and say, oh, this is cancer, this is not cancer. And the problem there is getting someone that, that human investment to tell you what that is. So then I use that data to train the AI. So then when I use new cases, it can make intelligent, you know, use that, the basic things that it's learned. And, and really the, what people don't see is some of the features. That's what we, we don't know. Sometimes when we use AI, we use a lot of neural networks per se as a model. And part of the problem is people just use it as a black box. They don't know what, what are the major features that this thing is seeing that the human eye or that I as a human is not seeing. And that's really where the magic comes in is it's pulling out those features that we weren't really looking at because we weren't perceiving it as humans. And, and, just, and machine learning, you said it's a subset. So it's a less, what, a less sophisticated version of AI to step on the road, is it, to AI? Usually, usually machine learning is more about when you have less data. You know, so you you know you don't we, we use really uh, deep learning and artificial net um, neural networks for large data scale large scale huge amounts of data. When you have small data sets or incomplete data, you know only a few samples, you're better off with machine learning. And of course, I always make the analogy. You know, you you don't need a, a race car if a bicycle will do. <laughs> you know, so it, because we also talk about the training time AI. When it, once we build and train a model, it takes, you know, right today, unfortunately, there's hundreds of thousands of parameters that need to be trained. Those are hours and hours and days of training. Once it's trained, yes, it's fast. But that investment, you don't need that in machine learning. It's, it's, it doesn't, it's, a, it's, a, it's the bicycle to get you down, you know, next door versus the sports car to get you around the racetrack. Okay. Good. Okay, that sets the premises. And um, so, um, in the report, like I said, you look very much at the application of this. In, say, let's, let's start with that, the air travel situation at airports, which is going to be crucial uh, now that we're trying to live with COVID nineteen and people moving around again. Um, so, just set out where you think uh, emerging AI technology could really change the way that airports operate, and actually for the better. Right. So, so, you know, even before, even before COVID-19, I believed that AI was going to really evolve the way we travel. So for instance, you know, and, and right now, post COVID era, it's going to be, everything has to be contactless, right? Or, or we're going to try, strive to be contactless, which is, oh my gosh, right there. And, you know, so you're going to see a lot of AI coupled with robots to do things that we don't want you know, our, um, our low paid workers who are cleaning the bathrooms to be high, more susceptible to disease than anybody else. So using automated robotics to do those disinfectants, but not only disinfecting it, but also monitoring. So, you know, so one of the things I always look at is when you get to the bathroom, they have those little smiley signs at the air, you know, how was your experience? <laughs> and part of that is trying to measure the traffic going through these bathrooms because if I'm, you know, you have heavy, no flights coming in, then do I need to disinfect this bathroom every two minutes? If I've got, you know, massive amounts of traffic coming in, then I know that I need to disinfect it. So the monitoring is also going to look at that. I wouldn't be surprised. I'm actually working on some technology right now that's looking at pathogens. So it might even be looking for bacteria, you know, throughout the, the airport in different places to, you know, where should I be disinfecting? So that's one. But then there's the user experience. So as a traveler, what am I going to see is different? I'm going to see two things. One, uh, security is going to be very different because one of the highest contaminated things in airports, and I, I, you, you might think it's the bathrooms, it's those containers that they put your, your, you know, your stuff in when you're going through the security line. So you know, right there and then, everybody's handling those. So I think what you're going to see is more of people, you know, giving their, you know, being responsible with your own, you have some wipes wipe right down your own area, because I don't think other people are going to do that for you. Even when you get on a plane today, one of the first things I do is I take out my wipes and we clean the tray and the seat and the armrest. So now I think that you're going to see a lot more of that automated. So before you get on the flight, hopefully there'll be new um, technology to do that for you, to give you some level of assurance that the plane has been cleaned a little bit better. But then user experience wise, and you know, how's it gonna be? Well, now they've got sensors everywhere. So that's another one that I can pick up different types of things going on in traffic, but I can also try to integrate your experience. So 
Right now, if you make any sort of travel arrangements online, it also suggests, oh, well, you need a rental car, you know, oh, do you need a hotel? And they try to, you know, do one-stop shopping. But when I think about getting on and off the plane, when you get off the plane, the first thing you might see is some augmented reality. Maybe you put you know, on your cell phone or your, you know, your sunglasses, where, where's my connecting flight? You know, I, I've, I've been in Tokyo trying to say, so how do I get to my connecting flight? I don't speak the language. So you're scrambling, whereas I think you're gonna have technology that will know you, a realistic view of here's where you are, here's overlaid arrows to here's where you need to get to. And on the way, by the way, when I first get off that plane, I wanna know where the bathrooms are and I wanna know where the nearest coffee shop is. So, and right now you can use an app to get into your, you know, you order your, your beverage. Well, wouldn't it be nice when I get off that plane, it's, I just run, I'm running onto my connection flight and I just stop, I know where the coffee shop is and my, my order's already waiting for me. I don't need to swipe my card, everything's done for me. And same thing, my baggage, I don't wanna wait at those carousels you know, now the bags will come out. I'll know exactly which position my bag is in because we have to social distance. We can't crowd around those carousels. My bag will come off. I'll know where to come to get it. I'll get it. And then I'll be able to have a much more smoother transition, I'll say. And even getting on the plane, you know, everybody bunches up and you're waiting in the aisles. I think you're going to see a lot more um, AI being used to order you of when it's time for you to get on or on that plane. It, it, it is actually, if you think about an airport, you know, it's a place where people come in large numbers and there, there are pinch points all the time. Security is one, you know, queuing to get on the aircraft to get, well, you get allocated a seat, but everyone wants to get on first so they get their bags on and so on. So there's all, there's all these points at which people are expected or, or, or not even expected, but sort of naturally heard together. Which is kind of, you think, not necessary, really. You've got a seat waiting for you. Why do you have to queue around uh, an entry gate when you know it's going to be busy? So I guess that's what's going to happen. Those sensors will tell people when it's where it's too busy, where it's too busy to sort of self-isolate it or um, self socially distance, if that's still yeah. Rule. In order, you, so, so maybe you know, so you, it knows when you get on, and it, it's going to check your bags and say, no, no, you've got too much stuff. You're not getting on that plane. Yeah. You got to check your bags yeah. rather than having humans do that nasty job. Yeah. I mean, in many ways, a lot of, you know, airports and operators have been talking this game for a long time. This, this is their vision of this kind of what they call frictionless travel, where it's very contactless. You don't have to really engage with, you know, with another person waiting line for stuff. This, this vision has been around pre-COVID-19. Do, do you think mm -hmm. now that what's happened in the last three, four months will just accelerate this? Because yeah. Yes, case, absolutely. Has been made. absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Especially they think about the, the robotic disinfectants and automated um, disinfectants. You know, you just all the spaces, the common spaces in, in an airport, you know, it, it, before everybody was like, well, robots are expensive. Well, AI is expensive. Now it's, a man, it's almost mandated. It's almost like, no, we have to do this. And how you cannot, you can no longer let people cram at the gate you know, and then the biggest thing is delays. So th talking, you have a flight delay, you've seen those waiting areas. Now, all of a sudden, they're gonna have to manage that. They can't, they can't just go say, oh, you know, it's too many of you here, some of you leave. They're actually gonna have it. So you, um, you know, you almost have like a fast pass to say, this is your waiting area, this is your seat, you know, in the waiting area, and you can't hog a seat next to you, or, your, you know, put your bags on the seat next to you and contaminate that. There, there's going to be um, many more rules that I think are going to take people to get used to. They, I think they're going to be very uncomfortable with it at first, but it's the same thing like going out in public now with a mask. At first it was, it felt odd, but now it's like, Oh, is that the person's mask? Right. Yeah. So I think that it, it might be a little bit odd in the beginning, but I think we'll get used to it and, we, and it'll, and the efficiencies will really outweigh the inconvenience in the end. That, that, that's it. I mean, the, maybe one of the reasons it's not already happening is, 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 is cost and cost of, um, getting this technology in place, developing it in the first place, then rolling it out it, it is potentially quite high. But obviously, the long term benefits mean that it, it, it's not so costly because it's once it's done, it's in forever. So, so it, it, it's going to require a change of mindset among you know commercial entities to say, you know, now is the time, even though they're probably going to be struggling for finances because the industry will mm -hmm. um, no doubt see a retraction. But now is the time to invest. Do you, do you, do you think they'll see that long-term vision? Is the danger they don't I, think they'll 
generation. And, and I think I think they will, but you know, the the other fear right now, Lee, is I was like, oh, AI and robots are going to take over my jobs. You know, we're going to lose all these jobs. And and honestly, that's the the nature of work will change because. For, you know, I always tell people, you know, again, this is not the, the science fiction robot that's going to be smart enough to know everything. It's, it's an assistive device, and it's going to take humans to work, to maintain these, to, you know, um, some, you know to, to make sure that everything is properly done. With the, how do I refill the disinfectants? How do I make sure things are being deployed? Who's monitoring it all? So there's, the nature of jobs will change. The jobs might be more technology-based. But it'll pull in a, pop, a new population of workers who will do more robot AI human interaction, which, you know, today a lot of people freak out about that. But if you think about it, you know, almost everybody who uses a computer today uses some sort of word processor. Everybody knows how to use a cell phone, right? <laughs> so, you, you know, as much as you say, I don't want to do technology, I'll know I understand technology, the user interfaces and the development that we're going to see will make it more conducive pretty much for any level of worker to utilize an interface and do their jobs better with this technology. Yeah. I suppose pre previous crises that, 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 that travels has dealt with, things like terrorist, um, terrorist attacks, you know, they've prompted changes in the way airports in particular work. But the outcome has always been actually people congregate more because it's, made, it's created greater, back, greater bottlenecks at, at security, for instance. This is the complete opposite, where there's a crisis which um, the answer is to congregate less. Right. It's a really <laughs> difficult one to get your head around, I guess, because previously mm -hmm. it's been the complete opposite. So it's going to yes. be a tricky one for the industry to, to really grasp, I think. Um, so, yes, clear, clearly, you know, airports are going to have to embrace this and, and, and airlines as well, because I don't think any airline wants to have to socially distance from the aircraft itself. Okay, it's no, just, no, they can't afford it. No, they can't. It's not feasible, is it? You want to do that beforehand and make sure everyone on the aircraft is, is mm -hmm. safe. What, what, what are your thoughts about, uh, you know, you've got lots of stuff in, in destination when, you know, people will congregate. So um, in hotels, in attractions, you know, theatres currently are still struggling with how they're going to operate. In the future. Mm -hmm. What kind of applications do you see in, 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 in that environment? So, um, you know, right now, if, if I go down to my, my local um, hardware store, when I go in, they make you hold up your hands and they spray your hands. So they don't want you touching all the merchandise if you're sick yeah. and you have to wear a mask. I think you're going to see a lot more um, temperature um, sensors looking for fever. So I think you're going to see everybody has to disinfect before they enter space. And I think everybody's going to have to be admitted to make sure they don't have a fever. Um, you know, so you'll see, and it won't just be temperature because right now the accuracy of the, of the temperature devices they're using right now is, is less than 70%. And that's kind of scary. So, you know, you've seen like, oh my gosh, they let all these people with COVID on the plane. Well, they did test them. This just the device failed you. So I think you're going to see a lot more thermal types of scans, but more improved um, uh, uh, devices to help you, uh, even audio. So, you know, if they hear your voice and they hear you coughing, um, you know, I'm working on research right now to, to look at um, x-rays of COVID patients versus non, as well as your breathing. So, you know, is there something wrong with the breathing that you could do that? So you're going to see all these sensors now trying to do a more informed um, you know, detection of is this person infected? And on top of that, you have to be careful because if you're wearing makeup or sunscreen, that affects that test. So you know, people don't think about that. So um, you know, that you're gonna see more robust sensors screening for um, feeders. Yeah, I, I suppose what we're talking about always is it's, it's an assessment of risk, isn't it? And there's so many factors, so much data you can put into a risk analysis machine and an AI would help that to actually ascertain the risk factors around being with people, how long you're in their vicinity, whether you're inside or outside, things like that. So there'll be lots of different things you can put into a, an algorithm that can assess the risk in a certain situation. So it, 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 do you see that sort of emerging where uh, each case that each case point can be different, can be dealt with differently based on an I, assessment of risk? I, I, I do, but I, th I think a lot of it, what they're trying to do, you know, there's, there's the I'd like to be proactive and figure out, you know, wh where to stay away from. And on the other hand, there's the, you know, where did it come from? How do I track it down? So they're always trying to say, you know, you were exposed. Who are the, you know, the people around you? We have to go back, you know, backtrack to figure out who you were exposed to. So I think that that's another thing. It, it, although, you know, when I get off the plane, it's going to know, you know, which bathroom did I use? Which restaurants did I stop at? 
And if I eventually contract the disease, that information is actually going to be very useful because then you can say, hey, anybody who got off of this flight, went to this bathroom, went to this restaurant, you know, um, you need to be tested because you were exposed to the disease. So that's going to be, you know, a lot of tracking and analysis information. And, and if you see, you, you just mentioned, you know, well, risk types of factors. If I see a congregation of an area, you know, like one of these sanitation robots goes on and says, you know, I saw this this you know table, this work table where people were plugging their laptops, or that you know that bar where you plug in to get your power was you know completely infected. That means that anybody who used that bar is going to be at risk. You can then know which areas need more. You know where, where do I have to focus more of my attention? Or there's too much traffic here, and we were disinfecting this thing every five minutes, and it still was like a hot spot for for you know, uh, spread of the disease. You're gonna see more analysis on space planning like that and a scheduling of services. Yeah, I suppose it's also something for de destinations as well. I mean, we, we, we travel these days with um, you know, these incredibly powerful computers in our pockets, which we call phones, but they're, they're, they're really supercomputers, aren't they? Um, and so when we arrive somewhere, a destination that embraces this can really help sort of move people around in, in ways that are safer. And, that, and it's gonna be their, their responsibility to try and manage that, I guess. So mm -hmm. I guess it's, it's destinations that can really embrace this kind of technology as well. I think so, I think so. Because, you know, again, when I, I think the overlaying augmented reality to show you how to get to that destination, but also showing you, sort of like we do now with traffic, right? You, you wanna know the best path to get there. Well, now it might be the best path that's been least infected or you know or the safest travel route will you'll have the least interaction with people um, things like that but also when you get to your destination you know you you want to enjoy you want to enjoy the experience and not be worried about oh you know when I go to my hotel room is it you know is it, am I exposing myself to, to this disease so I think you're gonna see a lot more um, outwardly promoted efforts on the destinations to say, look, this is what we are doing. Look, your room has been, you're gonna get information because if I just say, yeah, it's been disinfected, you know, people aren't gonna embrace that. Whereas here's what we're doing. Your, your room was auto disinfected with, you know, the lightest scans and <laughs> using AI. People might buy that, you know, a little better. And, and then the experiences I think that you get in the restaurants, right? Because we think, what do we do? We go to our hotels and we love to eat and shop. So, and then beaches as well. So I think that a lot of the destinations are gonna be even the servers, you know, how, your contactless servers. It's gonna be more about assurances to your customers that they're safe. Yeah, it's gonna be a lot around reassurance and, and trust, you know, and obviously I guess as human beings, we're, we're more inclined to trust another human being when they tell us something's been done as opposed to a faceless robot or an app. Maybe that's going to have to change if, if we're going to have to interact a bit more uh, digitally as human beings. We're really going to have to start trusting stuff a bit more. Now that goes goes back to the sort of use of data issue as well, which is another you know huge debate around AI and use of data, particularly personal mm -hmm. and health data. That's very sensitive. Mm -hmm. so, are, are, do you think this crisis changes that changes that calculation in most people's minds? Um, I hope it. I hope that they don't trust it because okay. <laughs> I hope they don't trust it because you know there's again you know talking about new jobs there's going to be a lot more new regulations put in place because if I say you know oh you know this is 99.9 percent .9 safe you're going to need the agency to come in or some sort of oversight or metric that you know because what am I using if I just go in and I say well, yeah I ran a UV wand over stuff where someone else has a robot going that actually fumigates and disinfects. We already know that there's a difference in that, right? You don't know the level of things of um, confidence. So I think you're gonna see a lot more standardization of metrics that are gonna say, you can't say this art unless you do follow these steps and follow this guidance. Um, I think that a lot of times when people blindly trust AI uh, or blindly trust anything, you know, to say, oh, I'm safe and, and um, you know, I always say, you know, it's 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 a, like a statistic, right? It's it is data. It is being doing some analysis, but there's always some uh, parameter or some outside case corner, as we call them, corner cases, or some other factor that someone might not have 
ever anticipated. So you're in your hotel and they tell you it's disinfected and uh, you know, a wild animal runs through your, you know, whatever, or something, or something crawls up your wall and a reptile's in your room. Have I just been exposed? You, you don't know. So I think that we have to, we have to always um, make sure that there's, there's people out there poking at it to make sure that we do our due diligence. That's the best way to put it. I suppose the, yeah, the, the difficulty for the travel industry in all this is at heart, it's, a hosp it's hospitality, it's about the welcome and, and that's a very human thing. And, and actually, you know, a lot, a lot of companies in, in, in travel do not want to take the human aspect out of it. That's their US, I feel that's their USP. If, if, if you're going to have a great time, it's going to be delivered by a fellow human being, you know. Mm -hmm. The idea that it's, it's going to go down the route, route of being robot driven or app driven is, 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 is one they don't really want to have to um, you know, embrace, well, but I do know there's a role to play. So can, can there be a balance between those two things? Then? Right. So I think that the human element is always going to be more important. I always say that the robot part is doing the jobs that we don't, you know, need humans to do, such as the, the disinfecting. The robots will not be replacing the human hospitality. They might be, you know, fun to, to interact with with your kid to entertain them while you're waiting in line for something. But for when when I get there, I want I always say, you know, especially when I call or something like, oh, thank God, a human. I get to talk to a human um, and people laugh on the other end when you say that. But you're absolutely rightly. So I don't see robots replacing humans in that capacity. I see them doing assistive jobs to help keep it contactless. So I might be talking to you over the counter, but when I go to hand you your room key or your access key, that's contactless or that's by a robot. So it's not me you know, physically having to exchange or exposing you. So I think that the robots are just gonna help us put in that layer of contactless but they're not, if I hope, and I would strongly recommend not using the robots to replace hospitality, unless you just want them as entertainment. That's the only and rule. I guess it's, look, it's, <laughs> it's a two-way thing as well. So clearly the customer wants reassurance that where they're going is safe, but equally the people you employ in your, in your venues want to be reassured that the people coming to those venues are safe as well. So mm -hmm. it can be applied on both ends. And once you know that, then those interactions can happen because you know you've created a safe environment. Right. That's right. That's right. Let, let's talk about the, the actual sort of core technology. So, like, you know, AI has been worked on for a long time, and, and you get the sense that you know, technologists will say it's all there. Just, just come and use it now. It, you know, we don't have to develop anything else. It's all, it's all ready and waiting. If, as long as you can imagine what you want to do with it, just come and, and put the data in and get get going. Is that the case, or is there still develop, technical development going on around things like AI to, to make yeah. it do the things we no, want? No. Is it, is it there yet? We, not quite we still have yeah, we still have huge challenges. Like I mentioned, the first one was training the AI, getting it you know known test cases that we know what the, the what we call the ground truth or what the results should be. You know, is this cancer? Is this not cancer? I'll give you an example. I was doing something grading forms of cancer, and you know, you ask six different doctors to look at the same set of data. You know, when they differ, <laughs> you know, it's like, well, how do I train my AI if my six experts? all differ on you know which grade of cancer this is so that's part of the problem a lot of people use um you know I mean, if you think of all the data on the internet you still could say you know i'll give you an example oh you know i want picture i want to train my my ai to recognize a hamburger well you can go out and find millions of pictures of hamburgers on the internet but now you know how do i know it's one of those meatless what do you call those unbelievable fake meat ones or a veggie burger you don't so somewhere along the way you have to, what we call annotate the data. Somebody has to actually say, this is what it is. And the AI learns from those, those types of cases. So that's one of our biggest challenges right now. And the other one is getting access to the data. So think about this. If I'm, if I'm a, I'm a travel tourist business and I have this unbelievable data that I've collected over you know, the past 20 years on what my customers like, what they don't like, you know, um, their favorite types of things, I'm going to keep that as my proprietary, you know, knowledge because that's going to help me pitch better to them and market better to them. Am I going to share that with the industry? So part of the problem is we're collecting all this data, but you're going to see a lot of corporations and industries using it for their own advantage and not sharing it. So in the medical industry, we, we are sharing, you know, data about health cases and things like that to advance the AI. But in tourism or in um, the travel industry, are they going to do the same thing? 
if small businesses get together, you know, and you have consortiums of groups that are willing to share their data, not, not the privacy information, we're not talking about exposing, you know, your clients' private information, but more about likes, dislikes, and some of the patterns that the AIs brought out. Why not utilize that so you can grow larger and larger knowledge bases? And especially now, the data we've just collected pre-COVID-19 is, is going to be very different. So it's also going to be timely. You need to start over and keep it that, up to date. That, that, that is a challenge, isn't it? So maybe it the data you've got now is just not worth yeah. anything. <laughs> COVID's changed the, people's attitudes so much that what you thought you knew about a person's preferences is now no longer valid at all. So this is, this is a tricky, but maybe this is where AI does come in because can, can AI work without that historic, or at least you know, use the historic data to sort of inform how it thinks? But, but not just come up with a kind of, you know, an aggregate on, on what, what happened before. What happened before may be not relevant anymore. So actually we need to sort of take what we kind of know trend-wise, but project that into the future. I guess AI can help with that because it's not just based on previous behavior. Right. And, that's, and that's, you know, one of the things that a lot of people were, you know, I got a project and they kept saying AI. I said, well, you really, you really want a simulator. <laughs> I said, you know what, AI can tell you with data, you know, you can build a model based on what it's seeing and train it for day. But if you want to play with it and say, well, all of a sudden, you know, I want to see, you know, what happens if, you know, all of a sudden the, it rains 30 days in the month of June at my, my beautiful destination. How will that affect my travel next year when, when June comes if everybody thinks this is the rainy season or, um, you know, are, are, are some other types of events going on? So you can actually do those simulations and do those predictions. That, I think, is also going to be um, the future is trying to do the, not just the AI to figure out what, what we have now, but also use it with simulators to play out scenarios of you know, what happens if my supplies don't come in, you know, looking at, again, supply chain, nobody thought about, you know, what's going to happen when my supply chain is 100% cut off. We look at delays, but we never thought of cut off, you know, and so that's another um, thing. I think people are going to be more tuned in to playing out more um, different scenarios that they wouldn't have even thought about before. Yeah. And, and I think flexibility is going to be really key going forward for travel because people want to or maybe they'll need to change their plans very quickly at the last minute and it's often been difficult to, to make those changes to be allowed to make those changes without huge penalties as well so mm -hmm. you know, maybe a more intelligent approach to the, what you've bought and the rules around what you've bought might might help again reassure people that they're not buying something that's something that, you know, they're going to have an, an, an argument with their provider over over whether they should be doing it or not, whether they get their money back. So that, right. that, that might help with that. Yeah, and, that, and that's, you know, that's a good, really good point because that is one of the biggest stressors right now is that I feel that a lot of patrons feel that they've been held hostage almost because, you know, unless you're, you've got some credit card or something that will cover those fees or you've got some status that will do that. But if you could, if the travel industry could bring down the cost and do better scheduling, you know, build in and simulate all these contingencies of, you know, the plane, you know, maintenance and even using AI to detect when impending failures on aircraft are coming in. So, you know, we, we do that today. And if I can predict those things and bring down the cost of my operations, then they should translate that back to the customer. One of my biggest frustrations is I travel with my husband and my, my young son. And in this day and age, why can't I get three seats together or close by on the plane, no matter how, you know, how soon I reserve it? So th there's things like that, I think, that will happen because AI in simulation will allow them to better forecast and better plan and, and really change the way they do all their logistics today. Yeah. Does, does, does the industry or do in, does industry in general, you may not be able to talk about travels specifically, but does industry in general... Um, work closely enough with academia on this because a lot of the work's happening in in the academic world and um, you know the industry is a commercial entity and, and is that is there enough of a crossover there so you know that that's a really good question i i always usually you introduced me as an academic and a, a little like a little like twinge went through my body i always tell people i had a real job before i became an academic and i still have real jobs I'm an engineer and if I'm not doing something real that's gonna go into practice that people are gonna use, I, I don't even wanna waste my time on it. Now, yes, there's a lot of people working on the theory and the underlying foundational sciences under all these things, 
But the real key, I mean, you hit the nail on the head, is a lot of industries don't know how to partner with institutions to say, I have this problem, you know, can you help me solve it? Can, you, can we work together on these things? And those industry uh, collaborations really are a beautiful synergy because the, you're getting state-of-the-art work, the technology, and then for my students, you know, we get to work on these unbelievable projects and get, you know, and my students get training in a real world situations versus some textbook types of examples. Yeah. And, and I think you're going to see a lot more industry collaborations, but the problem is right now, a lot of industries like the travel industry, I don't think they know how to reach out to, you know, institutions to do that. And that's one of the beautiful things about the IEEE as an organization is it is that type of organization where people can reach out and say, I don't even know where to begin. And they'll be like your fingers and say, well, we've got this all over the world. What part of the country are you? Where, what world are you in? And they'll connect you. They'll actually, you know, connect you to resources. And I think that that's something that a lot of um, travel people in the travel industry or even airports and logistics, they don't think of engineering specifically to help them with their process problems and that's really you know we we, we really solve everything <laughs> that, that's actually interesting you, you mentioned your you know your young students and the young students represent a generation today that when they do travel and they do want to travel they want to travel far more sustainably and far more environmentally friendly and that's actually yes. one of the themes in the report that you contribute towards is, is sustainability so um you know it, the, the travel sector as an industry they worked more closely with academia and with those young students whose vision it is that they, you know, eventually they're going to have to provide for. They, That's they right. Have, and you're, those are the these are your future customers. That's right. You're getting insight to your future customers. Yeah. And they're the ones building the tech that's going to... They're building the tech. Look, um, that's been really good. We're in a good half an hour there. I think, well, let's just finish it with one quick sort of forward thinking question. If, if, if indeed, you know, COVID-19 has um, concentrated people's minds and changed people's attitudes towards adopting the technology they probably should have got on with doing a while ago. In your a rough estimation, how, 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 how much of an acceleration do you think we'll see? You know, it, would, would we have gone 10 years and this, uh, and before this stuff really came in and now we're looking at a five-year window? Or you know, are, 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 have we really started to, to, to see a situation in which things will speed up and we will see this stuff actually applied it's not talked about but actually applied and happening in real life right i i think that you know the old guard that would would have still you know the ones that, that that are old guard that's been in there that, that you know if it's if it's working don't you know we're making money and we're keeping stock you know holders happy why why mess with it you know maybe tweak it here and there and yeah. maybe work sustainability because future people are interested in that and we have to worry about that but I absolutely think that this has forced people to to consider robotics, to consider distance training, just even the way they work with their employees, keeping their employees safe as well as ensuring the customers and looking at really tearing right down to the ground their their operating procedures, their standard operating procedures. Um, you know, even with just think about distance learning and training, right? my school did not for the longest time did not want to do online learning yeah but guess what we're doing online learning and it's a new opportunity to reach into populations that you never had had you know could, could accommodate before so i think people are getting that yes it's going to be costly for me to you know change my mindset and to, to adapt to these things but in the long run, it's going to open a, a, a plethora of new opportunities that we never, never even fathom. Yeah, and they say, well, say crises, as a crisis, often comes a lot of innovation and, and, and progress. So we will see, but I'm, I'm sure we'll that's the case. we will. Karen, thank, thank you very much for your time today. It's been really good, really fascinating. Thanks a lot. And, uh, thank and good luck with everything. And um, we'll see you around again, I'm sure, at some point. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. Bye.